I've listened to Mr. Misunderstood by Eric Church for years. And I listened to it once yesterday. Welcome to Spin It. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Spin It, the record-ranking podcast for people who would rather be listening to music. I'm James. With me is my buddy Connor. Oh, we're buddies. Yeah. Well, I figured after last week when hell froze over and we repaired the bridges that we had previously burned, thought it was just time to extend an olive branch of friendship once more. Not only are we friends, but now we're buddies. Yeah. To rekindle the fires of buddyship that have long since burnt out. Well, no, no, no fires. No fires. We've frozen over. <laughs> Oh, that's true. It's the uh, snowstorms of buddy ship. We've got an icy buddy ship. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you ready to get around here, Buzz? Yes. Sounds like you're pretty enthusiastic about that. Oh, sorry. Hang on. Yeah. Oh, sounds like you weren't very enthusiastic about that. Yeah, and then now you can use whichever one uh, makes more sense after you find out how I feel about this album. Oh, that's true. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Look at you even tricking me as we record now. <laughs> I'm going to split the difference and say that you're a medium amount of Round Here Buzzed. I got a medium buzz going on. Yeah, you're holding your own. Man, it's been a minute since we've done any actual like modern country. Modern country? Yes, it's been a while. Country in general? It's not been so long. I mean, we did Willie nelson earlier in the year right that's why i said modern country modern yeah <laughs> yeah it's been a bit <laughs> yes you're correct unless we change what you said and then you're wrong <laughs> well, but even this one i mean it's uh coming up on its decade anniversary yeah but it's still modern i think that's still considered modern until it gets passed i don't know when the modern when modern ends but it's probably somewhere around that decade mark so it's getting on the edge on the edge of modernity yeah i'm on the edge of modernity <laughs> that song, ironically, is not on the edge of modernity. I feel like that one's gotten pretty old at this point. Now, this is an album that, unlike last week, I know you knew a little bit of because you were singing Mr. Misunderstood before you were supposed to have listened to the album. What? When? More than last night ago. What? And you're more of a country guy. I feel like Eric Church is someone you've heard of. Oh, yeah, I have. The Chief. I know The Chief. I thought so. How much do you know? Did you know anything from this album already? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'd say probably about 60%, 6 out of 10. 60%? That's that's kind of significant. I know country. You do. Especially country that came out in this time period. Me too. This is one of my most known periods of modern country music, too. I mean, the country music video channel was like the only channel on 90% of the day in my house around this time. <laughs> Whoa. Which is always on for background music and stuff. Yeah. And there was a lot of good country music out at that time. And we'll talk about this and others. But yeah, no, this is the most modern country record we've done since like episode 27, Ingrid Andrus. Wow. Think about how many times we've doubled since then. <laughs> Not this again. <laughs> but yeah, let's learn about the chief. Well, I can't learn about the chief. I already, I already did the learning, but I'm going to convey the learning onto you. That's the, that's the goal of this, right? Hit me with it. The first mind blowing fact of the day: his first name is not Eric. Whoa! Yeah, and his first name is Kenneth. Kenneth Eric Church was born 1997 in North Carolina, and when he was 13, he first picked up a guitar to try his hand at songwriting. Within the next five years, he'd be playing local bars, mixing some original tunes in with a set that was mostly made out of covers. Apparently, uh, he liked Jimmy Buffett a lot, liked to play a lot of Five O'Clock Somewhere and whatnot. It's funny, that's the second time in a very short number of episodes that Jimmy Buffett's come up. Maybe we should spin cycle him this summer. Maybe. Stay tuned to find out. Anyway, Church graduated. Graduated high school, he went to Appalachian State University and got a degree in marketing. In college, he started a band called Mountain Boys with his roommate, his brother, and one of their friends. And after he graduated, he even got engaged, but his fiance's father was actually kind of pressuring him to take a corporate job with his marketing degree. And Eric just felt called to do music, so he broke off the engagement and moved to Nashville shortly afterwards to work on becoming a professional country songwriter. After he moved to Nashville, he pretty quickly caught the attention of Capitol Records, but they were really hesitant to sign him because they didn't think he was ready or that his music was, uh, quote-unquote, interesting enough for them. Dang. I know, I know. What a potential missed opportunity. But he was persistent. Actually, that's, you know, a big story you hear a lot down here is, is just the grind 
that people go through when they come to Nashville to become a songwriter and stuff. It's all about just putting yourself out there and trying and trying and trying. And Eric just did that. He was persistent and he was working with different producers until he finally hit the sweet spot with Jay Joyce, who had previously worked with artists like Emmy Lou Harris, Cage the Elephant, and The Wallflowers. And that was all that Capitol Records needed to see that Eric Church had finally made it. He was ready. And Capitol took Church under their wing. And actually, to this day, he still works with Jay Joyce. His very first album, Sinners Like Me, was a really, really strong debut. The lead single, How About You, shot up to number 14 on the country charts. And in 2006, he made his debut on the Grand Ole Opry stage. Short little Opry tangent. We haven't had one of those in a while, too. Is it even a tangent if I just mention the Opry? It's not really. It's part of the... Well, now now it is because we've gotten off onto a tangent about it. You're right. His breakout success in those early 2000s landed him as an opening act on tours with Brad Paisley and Rascal Flatts. But actually, here's a fun fact. He got himself fired from the Rascal Flatts tour because he would ignore the schedule that he was set for. He would play longer, way longer than his allotted window. When we say way longer, how long are we talking? Well, I mean, you think a concert runs on a pretty tight schedule. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, do you just do like an extra song, an extra two songs? So like how much is way over? <laughs> I think it, my understanding is it was pretty egregious. Uh, one song, two songs, maybe you can get away with it. I feel like he was three, four songs. And he was also really loud and rowdy. Rascal Flatts just kind of said, yeah, this isn't working out. See you later. They kicked him off the tour. And do you know who they got to replace him? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. <laughs> And when it happened, he actually joked with Taylor that she should give him her first gold record since he did her the favor of getting himself kicked off the tour. <laughs> and she actually did. Whoa. Yeah, Eric Church has Taylor Swift's very first gold record for her song called Tim McGraw. And it came with a <laughs> note where she wrote, thanks for playing too long and too loud on the Flats tour. I sincerely appreciate it. <laughs> I was worried that was a fact the mixtaper might bring, but it was so cool I couldn't risk not including it. He was definitely gonna bring it. Hopefully he knew I knew it. He knew you knew it. Good. So Eric learns from this rejection, kinda, and moves on with his career. Uh, later stints as a supporting act would go much better with artists like Hank Williams Jr., Miranda Lambert, Jason Aldean, Toby Keith, Kenny Chesney, and Dirks Bentley. And over the next eight years, he would put out three more records, Carolina Chief and the Outsiders that would produce a lot of hits. If you were, I mean, anywhere in the same vicinity of country music in the mid 2000s and 20 teens, you probably know some of his songs like Homeboy, Drink in My Hand, Springsteen, Like Jesus Does, Give Me Back My Hometown, Talladega. I'm guessing one or more of those names is probably familiar to you. And you, Connor, probably know just about all of them. Uh, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> yeah. He would also work as a featured artist on other performers' music. He was on Jason Aldean's The Only Way I Know, Keith Urban's Raise Him Up. Basically, yeah, he really was a worthy player in the country music game. Capitol Records really picked a winner. And all that takes us up to November 2015, when, without any build-up or announcement, he surprise-dropped his fifth album, a little 10-track record called Mr. Misunderstood. And that's the record we're talking about today. He really likes to do this thing with his records where he distributes a bunch of copies before it's actually released. So when he released his Carolina record, they went around campus at his alma mater, ASU, and they gave out copies of the album the day before it came out and then did a little release party concert. For Mr. Misunderstood, he sent the record out to all these members of his fan club, which also, by the way, the Eric Church fan club is named the Church Choir, <laughs> which is pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> Otherwise, though, outside of that little day early drop, it was a total surprise. No ads, no promo, no teaser singles, not a word. Because he killed it. Oh, not a word, because he killed the word. <laughs> that was so good. Bravo, that was so good. But he made the announcement of the album and that he was about to drop it by performing the title track live on the CMA Awards. Whoa. I know, what a way to find it out. Eric Church comes up just to perform, and all of a sudden he's playing this song that nobody's ever heard before. And everyone goes, oh, that was pretty good. And then he takes the mic and goes, hey, this album's out tomorrow. Like, that's pretty great. <laughs> that's pretty great. And that surprise release is kind of emblematic of how the entire record came to be. He started writing for the album, 
And within 20 days, he wrote 20 tracks. That's a track a day. Yeah, and 20 more days in the recording studio, and he had these 10 finalized and ready to go. And he finished that process in October. The record came out in November, less than a month later. So, I mean, conceptualize that. He went from nothing at all to a finalized, released album in 70 days. (laughs) That does not happen often. That's crazy. It really is. Let me put it into perspective. Hold on. So for us, 70 days ago is when we released Nina Simone's I Put a Spell on You episode. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, that's all the time it took. Anyway, that doesn't happen often. Mr. Misunderstood carries on Eric Church's usual modern outlaw country, country rock style, and it draws from a lot of different country influences. People have compared this album to the Allman Brothers, to Fleetwood Mac, to Wilco and John Mellencamp. He loves a lot of those artists and grew up listening to some of them, so it's a nice tribute in some ways. And the album worked really well with the fans. (laughs) That surprise drop and everything... Everybody loved it. It debuted at number three on the Billboard 200, sold 76,000 album equivalent units right away. Within a week, it would sell another 65,000 and climb to number two. By 2018, it was certified platinum. And it's been pretty widely praised by critics too. In 2016, it won a CMA award for album of the year. And in the same year, it was nominated for an ACM award and a British country music award in the same category. It also made appearances on at least six year-end best album lists pretty impressive yeah in the years since church has put out two more albums he's been named the 2020 cma entertainer of the year he performed the star spangled banner during super bowl 55 and more and he's got plenty of awards too he's earned six academy of country music awards on 27 nominations including the merle haggard spirit award he's picked up two Billboard Music Award nominations, a CMT Music Award on six different nominations, and he's got four CMA Awards on a whopping 30 nominations. Church has never won a Grammy, but he's been nominated 10 times. His most recent nomination was in 2021 for Best Country Solo Performance with the song Stick That in Your Country Song. This is a fun fact. In 2012, he was a CMT Artist of the Year, and to congratulate him, he received a video from Metallica's resident beekeeper, James Hetfield. Nice. I know, right? Oh, do you think? Oh, maybe it's a buzz thing. Eric Church does round here buzz. James Hetfield has bees. You know what sound bees make? I almost wanted to say a different sound right there to answer your question, but I couldn't think of one that was funny enough. No, that would have made you sound really silly because everybody knows that bees buzz. I almost just went moo. <laughs> moo. I think he's our first recipient of this particular award. In 2022, last year, he was awarded the North Carolina Award, which is the highest honor that the state gives to civilians. So kudos to you, North Carolinian Eric Church. Other fun tidbits. He's the founder of the Chief Cares Fund, which helps underprivileged families in Tennessee and North Carolina, and it does a lot of international national work in places like Nepal and Haiti. So he's a bit of a philanthropist. And the other cool bit of information I found is, you know, Eric Church's signature look, right? He's always got that pair of aviator sunglasses and the hat. And there's a reason for that. He wears contacts, usually. And when he would perform on stage, he noticed that being under the spotlights and and all the heat and stuff, it would dry the contacts out. So the glasses and the hat started as a nice little solution for that, but it really worked its way into his brand, kind of became his trademark style. And it's even the logo for the honky tonk they're building in downtown Nashville called Chiefs. That's his hat and sunglasses, and that's the iconography they used for it. So kind of cool. But with that, I mean, let's see what facts the mixtaper brought that I didn't find. I'm sure there's plenty of them out there. Hey, it's me, the mixtaper. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. How are you feeling this week? Because I'm feeling great. That's how I feel. Deafening silence. (laughs) I thought you cut out again. I was just, I was waiting for a response. You just feel silence. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Yes. Wow, I'm sorry. I, I... I didn't mean to put you in a bad mood after... I'm still in my mourning period. Yeah, I'm so sorry. But the show must go on, as they say. It shall. I'm also in mourning for two great potential facts that were stolen from me by nosy researchers. It wasn't... Not super nosy. Pretty common knowledge kind of stuff. We will see how many of these other ones you know. 
Yeah. Hey, listen, you're still having a record year. I I know you've recently come off a high, but you've had a lot of wins so far, or at least non-losses, having a a record year. That's yet to be seen. That's true. Only time will tell. And only time will tell how you do with this first fact. Bring it on. I'm confident, and that means I'm going to (laughs) lose. He's had the same nickname three times. The same nickname three times? Yes. Interesting. Is it Chief? Has he been the chief three times? It is. He's been the chief three separate times. Okay, well, at least two of these times seem connected. Because I feel like he named the album Chief after he received the nickname Chief from one of the other things you're about to tell me. And then... No. No. Go ahead and tell me what you know about his nickname, the Chief, outside of what you already told the audience. What I know about it, I always assumed it was based on the album Chief, actually. Incorrect. It's not. At least I'm telling you it's not. The very well could be. <laughs> right, right. So what's the first time he gets nicknamed Chief? Uh, I'm actually going to start with the most recent. Oh, okay. Start with the third time he was nicknamed Chief. <laughs> we'll work backwards. The third time and most recent was by his band. Is it just because he's like the leader of the band? Because of his signature look that you mentioned with the contacts and the sunglasses and the hat. Why? It has nothing inherently to do with the nickname Chief. No, it's because it made him look like a police officer. And so they would say, oh, he's in Chief mode. The Chief is here whenever he put on the outfit. Okay. Chief mode. <laughs> Awesome. So what you're trying to say is he was a law enforcement officer. (laughs) Add him to the club. That's the most recent time, but that's before the album Chief came out, right? Correct. And so now we're going to jump to the first time and the inspiration behind why the album is called Chief. Oh, okay. It's because of his grandfather. Oh, that's cool. So his grandfather had the nickname first then, and he kind of inherited it. Yeah, from his maternal grandfather, to be exact, who was nicknamed Chief because he was a chief of police. Oh. And so everybody, including his own son, would refer to him as Chief. Is that a nickname or just like a job title? Uh, I think it's a nickname if everybody outside of, even outside of like work hours is calling you Chief. Well. And even after you've retired. I mean, your job is to be a supervillain and you're the mixtaper, but everyone calls you mixtaper all the time. No, that's just because that's my name. No, I know you have a real first name. Mm. You've been keeping it a secret and you may never tell us, but <laughs> I'm just saying we also refer to you by your job title. It's true. But anyway, so then, you know, his grandfather, when he was born, would refer to him as Little Chief. Little Chief. I love that. And so. So that was time number one. So that's time number one. What's time number two? Time number two was from his almost father-in-law. Oh, the one that wanted to push him into banking and marketing? Yes, the one from his first uh, engagement. Okay, what does Chief have to do with that? Is this what he called him? That's the nickname he gave him. And it was organic. It, he didn't know about the first... Yeah, th- none of these knew about them. Even the band didn't know about the grandfather when they started calling him the Chief because of his look. No way. <laughs> so we're all three organic. Wow, that's almost unbelievable. What are the odds? What are the odds? That's what you got to figure out. Yeah, that's tough. It would be really easy to name the album Chief for any of these reasons. And then obviously the band could start calling you Chief. But I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I think this is a fact. Locking it in? Yeah. My gut, though, is telling me that it's a fact. And so I'm a little worried because I'm in sync with myself. And Uh Uh-oh. That's never good, as we've learned. (laughs) Yeah, but I think this is a really interesting bit of trivia. And I want it to be true. So I'm also leaning into that a little bit. Mm. Tell me, is he a triple Chief? He is not a triple Chief. This is a spin. But... It's close. It felt really close. The fiance one completely made up. Darn. The grandfather one, his grandfather had the nickname Chief first, but I, as far as I'm aware, never called him Little Chief. Oh, that was good. That was really yeah. good. And the band did give him the nickname based on his look, not based on the album. The album was named after the grandfather who was nicknamed Chief. So that part was true. So the band gave him the nickname without knowing that his grandfather's nickname was Chief. And then he decided to dedicate an album to his grandfather. Wow. That's disappointing. Uh, the father-in-law thing. It made sense. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Can't you just picture the father-in-law going, time to go into marketing chief yeah yeah shoot you were in sync with yourself and we know that that's a problem (laughs) i knew it i knew it we're gonna go to our next one which is 
You already mentioned he got fired by Rascal Flats. I sure did. Stole that one from me. Stole is like a loose term. It belongs to the world. Really, you only stole half of my fact because he's been fired a second time. Who fired Eric Church the second time? Well, actually, this was technically the first time. Rascal Flats would have been the second time. Okay, <laughs> who fired Eric Church <laughs> the first time? The Home Shopping Network. The Home Shopping Network? Like QVC? Like he's Yeah, well, HSN, but yeah. Sure, right. Yeah, but he's like trying to sell things on TV. What's he selling well he's he's not the one selling well i guess he is in a way he's not like the person in front of the camera selling oh he's not is he behind the camera is he a cameraman no what's his role he is what's the name of the person who answers the phone the person who answers the phone fair enough that's what we'll go with <laughs> he's the person who answers the phone i don't know if you need a more specific name yeah you know when they're like call now to order 200 knives for Fifty nine ninety nine. Call this number. It's no way that's that cheap. It's eighteen easy payments. Okay. And that's the number you call. And Eric Church picks up. At the time, Eric Church would have been the one to pick up. It, was he famous at the time, or was he just like working? No, this was his first job upon arriving to Nashville. Oh, interesting. And so, what did he do that got him fired? Talking people out of making bad purchases. Well, hold on now. So <laughs> I assume when you answer the phone, you're probably just answering about the the one product, right? Yeah. And so everybody that called about that would, in his eyes, be making a bad purchase. So he would just try and talk everyone out of buying whatever they're selling? Pretty much. That's an awful... <laughs> Good for him for looking out for people, but like, yeah, he got fired. It's like, if I, it was like we started the episode and I said, don't listen to Spin It. Why would I do that? <laughs> Technically, he got fired for not meeting his sales quotas, but... Well, okay. Yeah, which you wouldn't do if you actively discouraged people from buying. How many customers did he lose and how long did he like last in this position? position as he was actively undermining his job lasted 10 months to a year and he worked the midnight to 6 a.m shift oh oh yeah i think if you're calling into the home shopping network at midnight to 6 a.m you might be about to make a purchase you will regret yeah yeah and that's exactly what he would tell him literally uh, the 200 knives example was straight from his mouth he said that they would be selling 200 knives for 59.99 and somebody would call in and say i need these and he would say Listen, man, trust me. Go to bed and sleep on it. If you still want them in the morning, I'll still be here to sell them to you. Nobody in their right mind needs 200 knives at 3 a.m. Yeah, he's right. <laughs> he's got a good point. That's funny. But is it true? I want to say this is a fact. I, I, My gut is saying that is funny and makes sense. But... I'm going against the gut. I, I can't. It's a spin. It's a spin? I think you've made it up. Nobody needs 200 knives for 59.99 at 3 a.m.? No, that's true. Because they don't exist. <laughs> they don't exist, huh? This is this is a spin then? No, I'm just I'm just, I'm just confirming. Like that's that's your lot you're, you're locking in spin. Oh, yeah, of course I'm locking in spin. This is a fact. Ah, no. <laughs> oh man. Yep. Here is the interview in which he talks about that. Wow. It is straight from his mouth, isn't it? This is the story. <laughs> Crazy stuff, right? Yeah, and that's that's exactly how you said. It's, that's that's it. Uh huh. <laughs> Darn, you've already broken my winning streak. Yes, I'm back with next week potentially being able to start my streak again. <laughs> well, I mean, I would say you have to win now. The whole thing was you hadn't lost in 2023, but now that you have, yeah. you gotta win to get on a streak. We now it's gonna be I've only lost twice in 2023. How low can I keep the loose counter? Okay, golf rules. Yeah. Well, hit me with fact number three. We'll see if I can miraculously pull back a 50-50. Fact number three, he has his own furniture line. Ooh, this is a new one. I don't think we've had anybody like this before what kind of furniture does he make it's a whole home furniture compilation so all kinds of stuff chairs tables couches yeah, yeah. other things that you would have in your house as far as, yeah, as far as i can tell what is special about it did he design it is it unique in some way it's a collection of bedroom dining room upholstery and occasional pieces inspired by eric's eclectic music and lifestyle eclectic lifestyle how is this furniture inspired by eric's eclectic lifestyle uh, i don't know eclectic music and lifestyle well sure yeah music i guess i get it also says with a foundation of family values love of nature and a dash of attitude <laughs> this furniture is simply music for the home i do like my furniture with family values and a dash of attitude <laughs> <laughs> that's how i sit 
What's it look like? I mean, you can't show me, probably, I guess. I have pictures, if this is true. Yeah, I, I, I know. I'm just trying to figure it out in my head. What, what's it called? Highway to Home. Hmm. Is that a reference to Eric Church, like a song or a lyric that I don't know about? Or is that just like a, a clever title? Highway to Home is a song by Tom McDonald. Okay. But I couldn't tell how it related to Eric Church. I don't know if he's done a cover of it or... I don't know. Because I had the same thought, so I googled Highway to Home song, and the only one that I could find was by Tom McDonald mcdonald right the tagline is highway to home where will your road lead well it sounds like the answer is in the name leads leads home right <laughs> i mean yeah okay so i think this one sounds true when did this come out i don't know and where can i get it www.ericchurch.com slash highway to home oh wow it's a whole thing on his website it's inspired by his youth any particular aspect of his youth the fact that sawdust is in his veins sawdust hold on why didn't we get to this <laughs> sooner <laughs> you didn't ask what, in what inspired it or why he did this why did he have sawdust in his veins i mean did he do stuff with carpentry or did he mess around with sawdust a lot because his father actually worked in furniture so he was around it all the time growing up okay that makes good sense his father had a furniture store called clayton marcus of which he was the president nice the chief executive officer <laughs> anyway he was grew up around furniture like all the time right furniture kid does this furniture line have anything to do with sawdust or is it was in 2015 to answer the question i didn't have an answer for earlier we'll keep you go that's good research which would have been right when this came out i think this one is a fact going with a fact yeah now is this because your gut says spin or no actually my gut <laughs> says fact this time but i don't know what to do since trusting my gut and ignoring my gut both didn't work <laughs> so fair enough i think this is true and maybe i should get a chair with attitude who knows <laughs> this is a fact hey thank goodness thank goodness i stopped you from shutting me out this week oh or winning so far the chance is still there but it's a little slimmer Highway to home. Oh, it looks pretty sleek. All I can say is this furniture looks like it has some attitude. Yeah, look at that. Mm. Oh, the Eric Church Highway to Home Tap Room Brown Bar Height Bench is the last chance to buy it. Oh, hurry. Hurry up, everybody that wants the Eric Church Highway to Home House Brown Tap Room Bench. Uh, it's 3 a.m. and you need this Eric Church Highway to Home Tap Room Brown Bar Height Bench. 200 of them. Call now. <laughs> For a uh, not-so-easy payment of... Three hundred ninety nine ninety nine each. But that you, you're, you're paying for the furniture, but also you're paying for the, the attitude. attitude. <laughs> the majority of the price markup is for the attitude. You can't find attitude like that in normal furniture. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's see what my fate is going to be this week with one more fact or spin your fate's already partially locked in you can't win it's just whether or not you tie or lose well i might win if you decide to give me a, a fifth fact maybe i don't know why you would but i don't know why i would either but i do have a fifth fact <laughs> oh maybe i could convince you so i guess i'll let you pick which one of these last two you want four or five. <laughs> oh no i get to ch this is worse than picking the numbers i get to choose my actual fate let's take fact number five Okay, he has a list of people who wronged him. Who wronged him? Mm-hmm. Wronged him how? Just like everyone that's crossed him? Crossed him, stood in his way, hurt his career. And is this just like a blacklist of people he won't interact with or be difficult towards? It's a list of people he is holding a long-standing grudge against. How long is the list? I don't know, but he carries it on stage with him. Oh. Takes it on stage with him every time he goes on stage. That's interesting. I have a feeling Rascal Flats is on it, <laughs> if I had to guess. Oh, no, I don't know. He seems over that, but probably that telephone company is, is there. <laughs> I don't know if they stood in the way of his career or not. They probably help, helped him get where he is. Well, maybe in a certain sense by firing him. You don't think the company that fired him stood in the way of his career? <laughs> so it's a secret list. Do we know of anybody that's confirmed to be on it? No, secret list. Okay, so if it's so secret, how do you know about it? He's talked about the list existing. He just hasn't given any of the names that are on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he just admires people who are able to hold grudges for a long time, and he wants to be more like them. He wants to be... <laughs> Someone who holds grudges better, so this is like his way of practicing holding a grudge, just so he doesn't forget. I guess, yeah. He sees all these other people hold grudges, and he wants to be holding his own. Yep. 
He doesn't seem like the type that would have trouble holding a grudge. I, I think this is true, though. I think we're going to lock in another fact. Oh, going with true. I can see it. This feels like it could be real. This is a true fact. It's a true fact. 50-50 week. Did you already know this one? You can let me know now. No, I didn't. Uh, this is the other one I was afraid you knew. I had this one in the uh, nickname one next to another. Is like, oh, he could know either one of these. <laughs> I think maybe I maybe have seen it in passing, but it doesn't sound familiar at all. Also could have been equally made up and i would have believed that so we've gone 50 50 but there is an extra fact on the table yeah do you want to just nullify it because no uh, we're, we're, we're gonna nullify it if we're leaving we're yeah, saying yeah, yeah. it the 50 50 yeah so this won't be in play but i also want to hear what it is if i told you he's missing a rib would you believe me <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. You'd have a hard time selling that one. He's missing a top rib. How do you, allegedly, how do you lose it? Allegedly. Emergency surgery. Life-threatening medical scare. What was the emergency? He had a blood clot in his arm. And had to take out a rib? Yeah. It's caused by the top rib being too close to the collarbone. Wow. Okay. You might have me on that one. I might have called that a fact. And actually, for no points, I think it is one. It is. It is indeed a fact. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to give myself an extra point. I won. No! No! <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. We'll keep it 50-50. Respect the integrity of the game. Well, that's interesting. I, I had that one there. I had a feeling that's one that you would believe. Dude, do you know why he had a blood clot? I bet I know. It's because his veins are full of sawdust, okay? It doesn't mix. <laughs> oh, no. It's actually a disorder called thoracic outlet syndrome. Oh. But yeah, that's what I had. Wow, good round. I liked a lot of these. These were fun. There were some good ones. I learned a lot about Eric Church with these three facts. There was nothing overly outrageous, but also like nothing kind of boring. I feel like they were all uniquely interesting. These were rich facts, yes. Yeah. And especially since parts of all of them were true. Yep. I also feel like I don't go spin fact by fact too often. You don't. That's a rare combo. In fact, just because we like feeding you interesting statistics, the last time you went spin fact fact fact, it's been a bit. <laughs> Have I ever? Okay, ready? I found the last time you went spin fact fact fact. All right. Do you want to take a guess? Well, based on how long it took you to find it, I'm going to guess like episode 12. I mean, you're a little overshooting it. Episode 19, Chance the Rapper. Okay, I didn't overshoot it by much though. <laughs> no. So it's been... <laughs> 60 some episodes since you've done this particular fact and spin configuration that's crazy it really is this has officially pulled me out of my 53 hour morning period yeah i think it has you can begin jubilee i can have a pumpernickel sandwich well maybe not a full one i mean we did still just tie no yeah but as i said i measure my success by if you don't win that does make sense unfortunately it's just like how i haven't lost a game of tic-tac-toe my entire life <laughs> you've never lost a game of tic-tac-toe no i draw them all the time but i have never lost that's interesting <laughs> Really, really dastardly of you. I didn't realize you were such a tic-tac pro. Yeah, you know, I'm a tic-tac-toe world champion. <laughs> we don't have time to dig into that now, but... Uh, In the future. <laughs> maybe someday we'll hear more about the tic-tac-toe world championships. <laughs> but I'm glad we got you out of your funk, I'll be honest. Even though it was at my expense. But we'll see you next week for, hopefully, what I hope is that next loss. Regardless, it'll be an exciting round of Fact or Spin! Yeah! Yeah, well. Hey, Connor. Hello, buddy. Yeah, that's right. Yes, welcome back to the podcast, buddy. Well, let's talk about this album art. Let's! Let's. The album cover is of a chalkboard in a classroom, and it actually is in a classroom. And that person in the photo, you may be thinking, hmm, I didn't realize Eric Church looked like that. Well, he doesn't. That's not him. It's a photo of high schooler Mickey Smay, who went to this school in Rochester, New York. He's also the kid who appears in the Mr. Misunderstood music video. And he got connected with Eric Church because his dad, Jason, is a drummer. I think it's a neat album cover because so much of this record focuses on growing up and... I mean, honestly, like, school-type things. Like, I mean, Mr. Misunderstood itself, the song, is all about being the weird kid, being the odd one out in school. It's a, it's a coming-of-age record, and the chalkboard conveys that really well. I'm just a fan of a good old chalkboard. Yeah, there's something about it. It is how it is. But with that, you know what we should do? Spin it. I gave you the perfect opportunity to say, let's spin it. But I was answering your question. It'd be weird if my answer to what we should do is, let's spin it. Okay. You could ask, what should we do? It, so it's the you know that you have a problem with so like if i said ridiculous 
Connor, what should we do now? Oh, I don't know. We could, uh... Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I thought we had a plan. I thought we mapped that all out meticulously. Oh, oh, you were doing it now. Oh, sorry, sorry. I already, I already forgot. Go ahead. Well, there's really no reason to do it later. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Hit me again. Hey, Connor, what should we do? Let's spin it! Let's spin it. The <laughs> album starts off with its two longest tracks, back to back, which is interesting. Bold choice. It is a bold choice. Uh, the first track is Mr. Misunderstood, the title track right off the bat. Mr. Misunderstood. See, that's what you've been doing <laughs> all the time. Just that. You haven't been singing any of the rest of this song. Just Mr. Misunderstood. It's the only part of the song that was interesting. <laughs> really? You were disinterested in the rest? No. Oh. It's just the catchiest part. <laughs> well, it is definitely the catchiest part. I bet it's the catchiest six syllables on this album. And as we go, I challenge you to find a more catchy six syllables. <laughs> Deal. Good deal. We've got a game now. This was a pretty popular song. It made it to number 15 on the U.S. country charts and peaked as high as number 84 on the Billboard Hot 100. In its first three months, it sold more than 197,000 copies. There's multiple songs on here with six syllables. Yeah, there are. Chattanooga Lucy, Mixed Drinks About Feelings. That's it. Just those three. <laughs> well, that is multiple. That's a third of the album. It's true. Like a handful of other songs from the record, Church co-wrote it with Casey Bethard. And it's a really personal song. It seems like an older, more experienced person giving advice to a younger person. Some people speculate he's talking about a past version of himself. And it's a really encouraging message about how even though you feel like you don't fit in now, everything's going to be all right and you'll grow into your life in time. People will start to understand you more, even though you feel like you're an outsider looking in. What do you think? musically it goes through some changes I, I quite enjoy it it's quite catchy it is i also really enjoy how they kind of kick it up a notch for verse three yeah that's a smart choice it is a smart choice i mean like we said this is one of the longest songs on the album and so having those first two verses ease you into things is kind of nice then you get the chorus which just like sells you on the story and then when we come out of the chorus it really does just get the drums going it speeds up kicks it to a different level rolling stone actually really loved all those time signature changes and cycles and stuff they said the song much like the story has its own cycle of good vibes and bad and i agree and it's i have a question for you yeah does the line rub the velvet off my blue suede shoes and every soul on beale street dance like do anything more for you now that we've done our elvis episode and you've learned a bit about elvis and watched the movie and stuff yeah like i'm sure at the time you were like oh yeah that's an elvis reference but you know you're like i don't really care because i don't really know anything about elvis but now it's like oh elvis reference well i don't know beale street is more than just elvis and blue suede shoes is even more than just elvis <laughs> that was a carl perkins cut first yeah who cares who it was first but <laughs> yeah, but Elvis was the one that really popularized it. Who cares about Carl Perkins, he says. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. I just said who cares about uh, it first. I think we care about most popular. <laughs> right. I think those are great little nods to people that have inspired him. And he also talks about a few other people pretty directly, including Elvis Costello, Ray Wiley Hubbard, and Wilco's Jeff Tweedy. They come up too. Yeah, and it's cool that he kind of hardwires those tributes into these songs. Yeah. Pretty nice. And it's not the only time we'll see it on the album. I like the song, and it actually never feels very long. Yeah. It's five minutes and 19 seconds, and it, it just flies by. I think it balances its emotion and its message in a way that's really engaging and fun, and thematically and sonically, it just lays out the red carpet perfectly for this record. But we come out of the kicked-up version of Mr. Misunderstood into a bit of a slower song on the album ballad guy should love it it's mistress named music it also started a trend that is immediately lost um, after this song but made me want it to be a trend <laughs> well so it's not a trend it, the same we're having the same streak conversation again two is a streak right it's there okay well first of all what is it before i can tell you whether i agree i need to know what you're talking about i, I want an album called miss and then all the titles have miss in it in some way like mr misunderstood oh. mistress named music i just i just want i want an, i want an album named miss yeah and then you, know, you can have a song called mississippi mystery maybe that's the title of connor's hippin and hoppin album i am reasonably confident that it will be a miss oh no you're right this is the second song i guess that begins with the syllable miss <laughs> it's another church better cut and it's a clever little twist of a song he's got the girl of his dreams in his wife but he also has to dedicate so much of his time and attention and love towards his passion and his career music so in that way it's kind of like his mistress which is a really really good metaphor it's a concept that has been saying about a lot but not necessarily in this way yeah no definitely not it feels wholly unique and it's another instance where he talks about 
people he knew in his past, music that inspired him from an early age, which really illustrates its importance and prominence in his life. I mean, the very first verse is remembering Miss Bessie singing and playing the piano in church or organ. I don't know if it's a piano or a church organ, but either way, he says he's still chasing that song. Country music is really good about this. Coming up with interesting phrases. Mm -hmm. Country music is, is like a lesson in phraseology with a guitar full of freedom and a head full of lines. Like, that's not a thing, but you totally understand it. It's very cleverly written. Yeah. And at the end of the course, he talks about having a crazy heart that he's born to lose. And I think the interesting kind of sub twist of the song's twist is that we never do figure out whether he actually loses it to his dream wife or to his mistress music. It's kind of unclear. I like mistress name music. I do as well. It's a very personal, heartfelt song. This is a great touch after, I mean, the similarly personal Mr. Misunderstood. I'm also a fan of the ba da 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 the like him like just singing the the notes ba da da yeah yeah it's nice it's him using that voice like an instrument but honestly by the end of these two very long tracks surpassing 10 minutes in length that are very personal and slower and emotional Chattanooga Lucy just hits like a biggest refresh ever yeah it does it's very bluesy kind of Almost like, I don't know, redneck kind of country. I like it a lot. It's, it's about this woman, Chattanooga Lucy. There's a lot to handle, more or less, just generally. <laughs> And I love how the lyrics really match the music, the energy of it. They convey how eccentric this woman is. She's in this rundown A-frame house in the middle of nowhere, but she keeps him coming around. People have talked about how the repetition of coming around, coming around really emphasizes just how often he comes around. <laughs> and I really like that interpretation. Yeah, I just think it's a good, I don't know what the term is for it, but it's something akin to alliteration. It's like alliteration and repetition had a baby. Okay. <laughs> It's it's the rhythm of the da 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 on top of the Chattanooga, which is a a bouncy word. Like I, I don't even know how to describe it anymore. It, words have lost all meaning to me. <laughs> You're Mister Misunderstood again. You got the Chickamauga, the Chattanooga coming around, coming. Around. There's a lot of bounce bouncing, da 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 going on. Da, 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 Chattanooga, da, da, da. A little rat tats Little rat tats Yeah. Well, this is a rat tatty song. Yeah. You know, give this give this song a a French restaurant to manage. That's ratatouille. Oh. That's not not rat a -tatty. Oh, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're going for, though. rat a -tatty versus rat -a The American rat a -tatty, rat -a -tatty. <laughs> Eric Church, recipient of the Spinet rat -a Award. <laughs> he deserves it. There it is. What is he being controlled by? Under his baseball cap. Oh, that's why he wears a hat. It's because something's under there pulling the strings. Your guess is as good as mine. A bald eagle. America. <laughs> <laughs> An eagle? <laughs> Sure, why not? The Americans ratatouille. <laughs> I love it. I really love the guitar part in Chattanooga Lucy. It does, it similarly follows the lyrics and its bounciness and the bass anchors it down while they have a lot of higher up parts to just cut in. Very fun. But also we keep the mood heavy. Chattanooga Lucy is a little bit more fun than the first two songs, but then we move into mixed drinks about feelings and just like turn on the waterworks, you know? Yeah. It's so sad. Church wrote this one all by himself and it features Susan Tedeschi of the Tedeschi Trucks Band. It's about this couple that splits up and they're both drinking alone to try and cope with the pain of the breakup it's clever too some of the wordplay turn on a neon light to make it feel like night which doesn't directly say but it implies that he's like day drinking yeah which really just goes to further illustrate the state that he's in a voice running circles around my brain screaming louder than the pain just nice it's impressive and a song this good with lyricism like this that he wrote by himself i mean that really just shows off how strong of a lyricist he is sometimes it's hard to tell when you get a lot of co-writers in the mix who contributed what but this is all church you can just tell also their voices sound good together yeah they go together really well i love the chorus of this song the ways that they walk it down and create tension with the music and then resolve it and it's just very satisfying and one thing i wanted to talk about early on this album eric church does this thing where for lack of a better word he nounifies an abstract thing he takes this concept and then solidifies it into an unusual image here in the chorus he says my figured out has never been more confused yeah where he takes the state of having things figured out and like that's not a, a thing you, you don't have a figured out but he nounifies it but he turns it into a noun and then says now it's confused yeah it changes the condition of it very clever and difficult to like think of 
I love it. I've been trying to figure out the title and hook of the chorus. Having mixed drinks about feelings and you. Yes. Like, what's going on there? There's something going on there, and I haven't been able to put my thumb on it. Yeah, I know. I have worked long and hard to decode this one, too. Like, I tried, like, seeing if it was another one of those, like, where he's flipped the words around. So I was, like, having mixed feelings about drinks and you. I was like, that is close. That's what I've always thought. Yeah, it's got to be something like that, because, like, mixed feelings about you and then mixed drinks about you. Like, I'm drinking because of you sort of thing and then he's like i don't know there's something there but then it feels like about and and are in the wrong spots <laughs> yeah i'm not a hundred percent on it and feelings about you feels like it should be the line i don't know man my figured out is also pretty confused right now <laughs> yeah but i do love the song it's a good one and one of the more popular ones on the album is it according to the spotify plays that you love it's i guess technically fifth top half yeah i'm just saying there's a big drop off from the first four a significant drop the first four, and then there's a significant drop-off to this at number five. <laughs> well, that's because this one wasn't one of the singles, and the other ones definitely got more radio play and music videos and whatnot. Because they were better. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to argue that. You're right. Anyway, for $59.99, you can get 200 knives in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, sleep on it first, and then talk about knives of New Orleans. If you still want knives in New Orleans, I'll sell them to you in the morning. <laughs> this is a hard thematic pivot for the album, I think. Musically, though, I think it keeps the vibes up, keeps them consistent. But, like, all these songs are reasonable, rational, introspective, real-life things. And then all of a sudden, we're thrust into the middle of this police chase as this guy is on the run from the law after he murders his lover. It's because he was having mixed drinks about feelings. Maybe it does tell a story, yeah. At least that's what we're led to believe, is the situation. Co-writer Travis Meadows says they did their best to keep it ambiguous, which is why the chorus doesn't ever tell us what happened. It just says, I did what I did. Yeah. We just have to guess what that is. But I also love the adamantness of that. I did what I did is like, yeah, I own it. I committed this act and I am not hiding from it. Which is interesting because as the song goes on, the speaker kind of experiences this growing guilt. He kind of develops over time and it seems to take on like a bit of a metaphorical runaway from himself and his actions as well as he's running from the law. It's very cool. I think it does kind of, I don't know, me personally, I wanted to build off of the previous song. I kind of do too. Especially because of the one chorus line. One Wrong Turn on Bourbon, which I'm sure is some sort of reference to some place in New Orleans, well, but it's also an alcohol, so it could tie in. It is to... Bourbon Street, the most famous place in New Orleans. <laughs> sure, because I know I know New Orleans and its famous streets. Well, now you do. It, honestly, the whole thing could be a continuation, right? I haven't done this in a while. So Mis Mr. Misunderstood is about him growing up, right? And yada, yada, yada. Uh-oh. King of Concept Albums is back. Okay, the King of Concept Albums has returned. So you got Mr. Misunderstood, which is like him growing up and how, you know, he's under misunderstood all the time, yada, yada, right? Then Mistress Name Music is about how he's got this l person that he loves, but he's also trying to juggle oh. this career. The career and the music life, yeah. Yeah, and then Chattanooga Lucy. We find out Lucy's the name of this woman that that's so awesome and why she's awesome. The mistress. That he then has to try to balance this, this life. He's like, when I come home, right, come around, come around. That's him, like, come Coming back from his mistress out on the road, right? And uh, then mixed drinks about feelings. Ooh, it hasn't worked out. You know, he's day drinking a bar because she's left him or whatever. And then he kills her. <laughs> That's a new hour. So, again, again, really hard <laughs> pivot for me. I don't mind it, but yes, it does take a turn. So yeah, first five, all, all telling a story. King of concept doubles. Yeah, that, that makes sense, I guess. I also got to certify poetry on the line, they'll take me dead if they ever take me. Because to me, that sounds like he's implying that even if he gets taken alive, he's going to be really emotionally dead as he comes to terms with the acts he's committed. Like he's spent the last parts of himself. And so they'll take me dead if they take me just because there's nothing left alive. Oh, I just interpreted it as either he's going to get away or they're going to have to kill him because he's not surrendering. Or they're going to kill him. <laughs> I know. Yeah, there's that too. There's the literal side of it, but... I don't know. I just like to read into things. King of Concept album should understand that. <laughs> I do like, though, the ain't no getting out that I can see implies that even if he does get away, he's, there's still no escaping what he's done. Okay, so that's the same thing I said, just on a different line. No. No. Because yours was about if he got caught, mine's about if he gets away. Two different thoughts. Check yourself. He's either going to die because they're going to shoot him because they caught him and he's going to go down fighting, or he's going to get away and be dead inside because he's haunted by what he's done. That seems to be the consensus. Yeah, we're kind of on the same page about that. Yeah. But we never know. So that's, that's the end of the story. All we know is that he did what he did. Yeah. 
and he has no regrets. Up next, we're getting around here, Buzz. Which means he did get away with it and is now living in this small town. <laughs> with your concept <laughs> in place, I guess so. And he's thinking of his old lover who, you know, quote unquote, left town. <laughs> no, okay, no. This is where it gets to be a little, a little much. Well, you can't say that he killed her, you know. Sure, whatever. In reality, it's about a couple, but the girl can't stand the small town life, so she heads for the glitz and the glam of the big city. And dies. No. <laughs> no. No, no, she's she's alive and well. Eric Church just doesn't like that lifestyle, though. He loves where he's from to such a degree that he gets a buzz from just being around. I just like this song a lot. Some of these lines are so clever and so vivid. Just even from the very beginning. There's another line of cars leaving. Home team's got an out-of-towner. Me, I'm sitting on the hood of mine drinking. I'm just a parking lot down and outer. Another classic nounification. Yeah. I mean, he does it with down twice. He does down and outer, and then he, down in the chorus, does till my down goes up. Yeah. He's now defying down all over the place. Yeah, he really is. But I do love that line. Putting them down till my down goes up. He's just, that's nice. And it's interesting that this song and mixed drinks about feelings both kind of are about the same thing. Just mm -hmm. like drinking to feel better or forget things. But they happen in such different ways and take on such different tones. Because in this one, he's like, he's content in the choice he's made, I feel like. Absolutely. He likes where he's at. And when he misses her, now he's not like sitting, day drinking, having a little pity party. What do you, what do you think about the line, I'm sure there's higher highs where the high risers rise but me i'm gonna sit here tonight that pre-chorus i like it a lot of highs it's a lot of long i sounds higher highs where the high risers rise yeah he says high three times in a row and rise twice in a row it's pretty good i think it is too it's an interesting idea it's a straight shooter song full of fun wordplay lyrical tricks that i really like and it's memorable yeah because i think to some degree it's relatable anybody who grew up in a small town you're either the person who stayed or the person who left <laughs> well you keep talking about eric church killing his lover i guess and you've been talking about how he's a lover of wordplay so now he's gonna kill a word <laughs> <laughs> yeah kill a word is the next track love it and and i'll tell you what if you were really getting into the nounification on the previous tracks oh boy this is the mother of it all right here the mother of all nounification <laughs> yeah. He turns all these words into characteristics and talks about, you know, uh, the ways that he would kill them. It's very clever. He says, if I could kill a word, like if I could purge these negative things from the world, here's what I'd do. And it's another really strong outing for his wordplay. I'd poison, never, shoot goodbye, beat regret. I'd pound fear into a pile of sand, choke out lonely, hang hate so high, another high, it can't be heard. That's that's the alliteration you're talking about, hanging hate high so it can't be heard. Well, yeah, that's alliteration. That's why I said it. It's not alliteration. No, I know. I'm, it's, it's just another example where he's doing stuff like that. And also, isn't there a different term for alliteration if it's a softer syllable? There's alliteration. There's like consonants and assonance if it's in the middle of words. Yeah, there's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. I remember English from high school. Well, it seems that you remember that it happened, but I don't think I can call you. <laughs> I remember that it exists. I think you can say you remember it. I don't know what it is, but I know it's something else. I know it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Again, you can sit here and really analyze how he chooses to kill some of these things. Oh, yeah. He's hanging hate so that it can't be heard. Whereas he's choking lonely with his bare hands. I don't know. There's there's something again there that if I really wanted to sit down, because like the choke choking is like a very I guess intimate form of killing, right? You gotta get down there, get your bare hands dirty, right? Well, what? <laughs> intimate in the sense you gotta be up close and personal, right, to do it. It is up close and yeah. And in which case you would not be lonely because you have to be with. I don't know. There's something there. There's something there. But the really good ones that I like best are breaking brokenness and heartbreak, laying over under the dirt, uh, putting upset down yep. in its place. There's so many. Every lyric is a new adventure. And the chorus, which only turns up twice, riffs on the old sticks and stones adage as he talks about just how harmful words can be when you can't unhear and can't unsay them. Yep. My question for you is, what word would you kill? And how would you do it? <laughs> I think I'd kill, I can't even pronounce it. I'd kill it because I can't pronounce it. The Worcestershire or whatever. The Worcestershire. <laughs> I'd, kill, I'd kill that just mainly because I can't pronounce it. Yeah, our sauce. It makes so many people's lives better if they didn't have to try to pronounce that word. Everyone would love you. Yeah. And yeah, I think I'd do it in a very public fashion. Like a like maybe a hanging or a guillotine would be good. I guillotine Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe you really are the people's champion. <laughs>
I think I'd kill kill and turn this whole song into a paradox of impossibility. Oh, I do like that every verse ends with the hook of if I could only kill a word. It makes it so you don't really need the chorus. Yeah, it's a good way to keep everything tied together. But the chorus is so catchy. It's nice. It's right. nice that it's there, but it doesn't feel absent because the hook is there at the end of every verse. I don't want the chorus any more than it's here. I wouldn't take it another time. You could offer me another chorus and I'd say, whoa, no thanks. It actually kind of makes me sad that he ends the chorus with the same hook. It, it makes the chorus feel less chorusy, I guess. It's following the same pattern that the verses did. I don't, I don't know what the heck I would put there instead, but I don't know. You kill the chorus. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I like it. I do too. It's holding its own. Sure it is. And I also like holding my own. It's another one of Church's solo rights. It's the eighth track on this record. It's about his family and the ways that becoming a husband and a father impacted his behavior and his outlook on life. I like that he rhymed lawyer with Tom Sawyer, but yet did it. He rhymed lawyers with Sawyer <laughs> instead of lawyer with Sawyer. And claw. -er. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like claw, -er, law, -er, Sawyer. <laughs> it was like, okay. It's <laughs> very interesting. He was a rough and tumbling lawyer, luck using guy. Just hops on his raft and now he's out there free spirited, living life his own way. And then when he comes up with the family, he gets to be a little more grounded with one arm around his baby and his boys. It's nice. And, and the title is a really clever pun because, you know, when you're out there by yourself, you're holding your own, you're managing, getting by. But now he's holding his, like, kin. Yeah, he's got his people to look after. And so his best job and most prominent obligation is just to be good to the people that are counting on him. So he's holding his own people. Yep. Love that. Clever. It is. It's a simple song in terms of its sound and its instrumentation, but the message is so powerful. I think, if anything, that simplicity really only amplifies the message of the lyrics. It just draws your focus right to them. And I also like the way it kind of hits on the offbeats, the rhythm of of holding my own is unique for this album and very cool are you ready to move on to what i'm just gonna let the cat out of the bag now is my favorite on the album whoa and i think is most people's favorite on the album uh, just off of spotify plays <laughs> no yeah i would agree with that and i'm telling you what record year is like if the spin cycle were a song i know <laughs> it would be this which is one of the reasons i picked this album i issue us a challenge on this day of this hour of this recording i issue the the church gauntlet the church gauntlet we've already got another challenge up in the air for the six syllable thing oh that's true i forgot all about that after you said it <laughs> well it seems like we haven't passed anything more catchy than mr misunderstood no I agree. Although having a record year is close. That's a tough one. <laughs> it's not as catchy. <laughs> having a record year. But it is also very good. <laughs> You're right. It's not as catchy. Okay. What's your gauntlet? What's your gauntlet? I, we can call it the church gauntlet, but the misunderstood gauntlet. Uh, I don't know. We can come up with a catchy name for it. I want us to cover every single artist he references in the song. We've covered a lot of them already. Well, everything that he implies or directly says, because he talks about everything from Jones to Jennings. Yeah. And I don't know if you know, but that's everything. No, it'd be any specific like name even if it's like a, a wordplay name right so george jones and waylon jennings would both make it on that list they sure would but let's talk i mean we've talked about hank williams in episode 12 yep stevie wonder songs in the key of life in episode 30 redheaded stranger yep uh, in 78 we are surely going to talk about james brown i just had one on the albums of the month last month and it was so good i'm excited for a potential james brown episode but the whole point of the song before we get too lost in it is you know he's going through another hard breakup that's really a repeated theme on this album or maybe a death maybe he killed somebody <laughs> i don't know what do you think just kidding i know what you think who's to say Who, yeah, we don't know but he did what he did and now he's coping with it by going through all of his old records digging up all the old music that he loves to try and drown out the heartbreak kind of turning to music his mistress instead of turning to the alcohol and stuff like we saw in mixed drinks and round here buzz and boy it's great he's having a record year not like a year for the record books the best or the greatest no just a year where he literally listens to a lot of records and there's so many puns that work on that since you turn the tables on me mm -hmm. counting on a needle to save me is a really clever twist because i don't know it, it almost sounds like a drug reference it does which it's not yeah uh it's it's good it's so good i'm either gonna get over you or i'm gonna blow out my ears which mm, is kind of a little dark yeah in its implications however in the context of turning up the speakers to 10 brilliant just 
excellent. But yeah, I mean, we're like halfway to completing it. That's what I said. I think if, yeah, when I was listening, it's was like, man, we've done like half of these references. It's very reasonable. Yes. So you know, I just think we need to keep track. I'm not saying we need to make any special effort to do it. I'm just saying we need to like keep track. We need to know when it's done. Yeah. It's a great song. Musically, it is so catchy and really good. Just the pinnacle of this record. And again, just the title itself being having a record year makes it sound like it's like I'm having a great year. But, but it's awful. He's having an awful time and an awful year and he has to turn to his music. Rock bottom. The entire thing's just like turned on its head. It sure is. It's great. And the album closes with the understated and maybe a little bit too long track, Three Year Old. I think it's too long. It's so... It's three minutes and 46 seconds. I don't know. It just feels long. I like it. I like it too. Don't get me wrong. The song actually really does a good job at taking the album full circle from the story of Mr. Misunderstood. Because, you know, back there, the wise older guy was given all this advice to a younger man. You'll grow into it. You won't be misunderstood forever. Mm -hmm. People will start to get you in time. Here, Church talks about all the things that the older generation can learn from the younger generation. So we've kind of come full circle in that regard. He talks about all the things he's learned from his own three-year-old, like how to lick mixing bowls or color with wild colors. Yeah, it's such a clever song. Yeah, it's fun and it's really lighthearted. I like three-year-old. I feel like modern country music is the genre for that, like you kind of mentioned earlier. Like, if you want turns of phrases or catchy little one-liners, like country, modern country music's where you turn to. It's a pretty good place to start, at least. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of great lyrics and catchy lines and very clever phrases in all genres of music, but... I mean, we've gone through this entire album, and every single song we've been like, here's a catchy lyric, here's a catchy line, here's a unique thing, here's a clever li line, you know? It's just been one after the other, right. and I feel like that's just what this genre is, especially when you find a good artist. Yeah, no, definitely. And again, and again, I just want to reiterate, 20 days. He wrote all these songs in 20 days. But this song, I think, does a really great job at illustrating some of the ways, tangible ways, that that childlike wonder slowly fades out of life as we get older and more realistic about the world. Mm -hmm. And so kids, he says, kind of teach people exactly what they know, which is how to be a kid. So they bring back all these things that we used to know and have kind of long forgotten. It's a really good outlook, I think, to leave this record on. Yeah, it's like looking at your kid and watching him pretend to be a cowboy on the moon. It's like, oh, yeah, it brings back that sense of i remember when i was a kid and would do that kind of stuff yeah but you know what there aren't even any cows on the moon so why would you need to be up there as a cowboy that's the kind of stuff you don't care about when you're a kid on an album that's full of really sad songs it's nice that we close on maybe the happiest of them but with that you know what time it is ba -ba -doo -ba -doo -ba -doo. you know what that sound means uh sometimes <laughs> that sound means it's time for final spin let's talk scores music music is pretty good on this album I think a lot of these songs end up being really memorable because of the music in them. Some really clever guitar parts and interesting walk downs and melodic decisions. And the music complements the lyrics really well. Each of these songs kind of feels like what it talks about, if that makes any sense at all. And I think it does. If you listen to the album, you'll probably understand what I mean. So I'm giving music an 82. I like it. Lyrics are the album's strongest suit, I think. Eric Church honestly holds nothing back. These songs are so emotional, just packed. And some of them are very, very personal. And they're just so clever. The nounification is just off the charts. And he's got that rat -a thing going. Very rhythmical in his lyrics, too. I really just like so much of this album lyrically, given an 86. Instruments of production, pretty solid. You know, there's not much to say. Like I said, the instruments are great. Some of the guitar parts are really clever and well executed, but... You know, production-wise, it is it is what it is. He did what he did. I'm giving it an 83, instruments and production. It's solid. And the overall vibe, also an 83. That's just how it feels to me. I like it. It's a good album. It's quick, with only 10 tracks, so you could get a nice little boost of emotion from it. And the surprise drop is really cool. I like that. Anyway, he wrote it all himself or co-wrote it with people. That's a bonus point. So the overall score is an 84.5 which means it ends up at number 286, which is slightly above middle of the road okay. on the grand scheme of the ranking spreadsheet. That's not bad. No, it's not. It's a score that I'm content with. Now, its placement on the list actually puts it really close 
to Ice Nine Kills the Silver Scream, which is an interesting one to compare this to, I'll be honest. Yeah. They both have 84.5, and their unweighted score is both an 83.5. So what breaks the tie is their music score. And unfortunately, the Silver Scream got a better music score than this, even though this has a much higher lyric score. Mm. So Mr. Misunderstood takes the back seat to Silver Scream, if you're curious about the ties and tiebreakers. Interesting. And if you want to know more, head to the website, check out the full ranking list, and you can see everything. Everything. There's, There's a lot. lot. Anybody who's a fan of spreadsheets, check it out. Or music. Or us. If you're a fan of anything, check it out. As for me, I had a hard time picking my top three, because I liked so many of these songs kind of equally. Mm, I do believe that. And it could honestly depend on the day. But for today, this is how it fell. Oh, okay. My top three in album order. Jump it all the way down to round here buzz. Whoa, that's a pretty far jump. Followed up by Kill a Word. So you're back half of the album the whole time. Yeah. Record year. Nice. And Conorable Mention going to three-year-old. Nice. And a lot of that's because I was just in a wordplay kind of day. Especially those last three there, those Kill a Word, Record Year, and Three-Year-Old have a lot of just good lyrics and whatnot. They do. But you skipped over Hold My Own? Hold My Own's got a wordplay in the title. Yeah, that one musically wasn't as good. Fair enough. <laughs> it was shocking because I I had some of the higher uh, stuff higher up on the album in there. And then, you know, the way I do it is when a song beats it out, you know, I just keep filling my top three. And then when it's full, I go back and I pick one to boot out. And as the album went, they kind of got booted out. But you skipped. I mean, the catchy Mr. Misunderstood that you've been singing along. I know. You skipped the ultimate ballad, Mistress Named Music. I know. And so this is a surprising top three for me. It was for me too. Told you, it kind of could depend on the day. But the way I saw it was Mr. Misunderstood. I kind of joked about it in the beginning. But, you know, I got the, the catchy six syllables, but the rest of it just didn't hold up to some of the other lyrics. It wasn't holding its own. Yeah, and then like Mistress Named Music loved it as a ballad. It was great when there were there there was other things to pick, and that's how they got picked on this day. I guess so. Maybe you should sleep on it, and if they're still your top three tomorrow, you call me. I'll still be here, and you can get them then. I can buy them for fifty nine ninety nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as for a score, this one's gonna get eight nanifiers out of ten. Nice eight. So, yeah, I think this is understandable from you. I know you really liked the album. You already knew six of its tracks going in. So I wouldn't have been floored if you decided to edge it into the nines. But it really does feel like more of an eight. It feels like more of an eight. As for placement in my eights, it's going very top of the eights. Really? Beating out Halsey? Beating out Halsey. Okay, that's good. Awesome. Well, now it's time to talk about playlist picks. And I'm pretty sure record year is going to be one of them. Yeah. Is that the one you're taking or do you want to try and committee it? I kind of want to committee it but i'm curious to hear what else you're thinking there are so many that i could pick i don't know i don't know maybe we should take knives of new orleans since we talked about it so much <laughs> if i didn't take that maybe i would take mistress name music i don't know or round here buzz oh round here buzz has some good nonification round here buzz is kind of where my vote is Okay, I, I can get behind that. Or Kill a Word. Mm. I'm also okay with that. <laughs> okay, you know what? We're going to take Kill a Word in record year. Uh, okay. I think those are two of the most innovative, just really surprising songs on this record. Like, I can't believe I've never thought to think of this this way. Uh huh. So I like those a lot, and I think those are solid. Those really sum up what the whole album is about. I mean, you got records, right? His love of music, his tribute to music. It's a breakup song. Uh, he talks about bourbon, scotch, and beer. The drinking aspect comes in. And then in Kill a Word, he talks about killing. <laughs> so there's the whole package in these two songs. Fair enough. Well, that's going to wrap it up with a bow for this week, I do believe. We'll see you next week for another exciting episode of Spin It. If you're looking for more content, all the cool graphics we make and etc etc you can find it on our socials on instagram at spin it pod official on twitter at spin it pod and on the web at our newly redesigned website www.spinitpod.com where we fixed up the episode listings a little bit and added some fun new features you can go explore stay tuned for next week to hear connor say wacky things like uh, say something wacky clownfish are the zebras of the sea yeah it's pretty wacky see it's pretty wacky you, you'd miss all the stuff like that if you skip next week so be sure to come back and until then keep, keep spinning. spinning okay i have a follow-up question for you okay what sauce is the most beheadable 
I think I already answered that. <laughs> well, that's just because you didn't like the word, but I'm just talking strictly based on the sauce. What does that mean? What is, what, hang on, what, what is the origin of that? Of that. You didn't even say the name of the sauce. I'm not even going to try to say it that time. <laughs> oh, well, that makes sense. It comes from England. Where in England? You know where. 